Hello everyone. Welcome to Voice of the Wild, a weekly podcast initiative by Naturalist Foundation. This is the fourth episode airing on 13 June 2020. With this podcast, we bring you closer to the world of wildlife conservation, scientific research and government environmental policies. I am Vanushi Naik and along with me I have I am Srishti Agarwal. Hi. I am Ritwik Menon. In the episode 4 of the podcast, we'll be talking about some really sensitive issues. So let's begin with the oil spill that happened in the Arctic region of Russia, which was a sure proof of ignorance that led to environmental problem. Then, moving on to our home country, we'll be discussing if the Hydel project can be shifted to a non-eco-fragile zone. It is also important to talk about some gas leaks that have occurred in our country due to negligence of environmental guidelines and how it is not being highlighted in the mainstream media. further we'll be talking about the road widening project taking place in the western ghats which shows the same pattern of negligence of guidelines then let's look at the water hazard menace and how it is a boon in disguise lastly there is a really interesting topic highlighting the protection of the submerged plateau in malwa so without any further ado let's get started today we will discuss about a quite recent oil spill which occurred in russia's arctic north area This has polluted a large freshwater lake and there's a risk that it could spread in the Arctic Ocean, one of the world's major ocean which we have. So let's have a look at exactly what happened. This incident took place on May 29, 2020. Melting permafrost caused a fuel tank holding 21,000 tons of diesel oil to collapse in Russia's Arctic Circle, leading to a 135 square mile oil spill. Now what is permafrost? The term is used for ground that is frozen continuously for 2 or more years. Some 55% of Russia's territory, predominantly the Siberia area, is permafrost and home to its main oil and gas fields. This spill occurred in the city of Norilsk, Russia, at a power plant operated by Norilsk Tymyr Energy Corporation, a subsidiary of Nornikel. The town is located above the Arctic Circle in Russia's far north. According to the Federal Service for Supervision of Natural Resources, 6000 tons spilled onto the ground and another 15000 tons of oil into the water. Oil products got into the Ambarnaya and Daldikan rivers and in almost all their tributaries. The company said on its website that an emergency situation has been declared. Greenpeace which is a global network of independent national and regional organizations that is the NROS which works for the betterment of the earth has already called the spill the first accident of such a large scale in the arctic area organization believes that damage to water bodies alone from a diesel spill in norilsk could amount to more than 85 million dollars A diesel fuel storage tank failed when the permafrost it was built on began to melt. As a result of damage to the tank, fuel spilled onto the roadway and a passing car also caught fire. The accident was caused by a sudden sinking of supporting posts in the basement of the storage tank. This was said by the company. The leaking diesel oil had extended as far as 7 miles from the accident site. and turned long stretches of the ambarnaya river into bright red color why this bright red color because in russia diesel is dyed red if it's used for heating of buildings and structures red diesel is usually pumped into special storage tanks and subsequently consumed as an energy source according to russian media The liquidation team has already cleaned about 53000 cubic feet of soil at the site of the diesel fuel spill in Norilsk and pumped out 201 tons of fuel. More than 130 tons were removed from the Ambarnaya river. Nornikel is the world's leading producer of nickel and palladium. Palladium is a rare metal used to make catalytic converters. Some local people are of the view that this is not an accident. A 2017 report of the Arctic Council, Arctic Council is an international forum which includes Russia. This report had already warned that because of global warming and melting ice, 
foundations in permafrost regions could no longer support the loads they did recently as the 1980s so somewhere they knew that this kind of mess is going to occur as global warming has raised temperatures especially in arctic latitudes melting permafrost has become a major problem these days in many colder areas buildings and structures are built on permafrost which can be as hard and had been as permanent as concrete that has begun to change with warming temperatures causing damage to buildings and other such structures according to sources it will take 10 years to clear the oil spill and these 10 years will affect the water bodies ecology and environment to a large scale now we'll see what would be the effect on marine life the heavier oils cover the surface of the water and affect the respiration ability of marine mammals the lighter oils on the other hand blend with the water and get absorbed into their organs affecting their functioning not only this but the oil contaminates the food of the marine animals causing their death oil spills can also have an effect on breeding as exposure to oil can affect the fish eggs we'll also see what effect the oil spill would be on human life while oil spills have a direct impact on marine life they also have an indirect effect on humans spilled oil can percolate through land surface and can get accumulated on ground water polluting it this can lead to increased levels of water pollution when consumed this contaminated water can cause many diseases humans can also face health issues after they consume animals that died due to an oil spill for now the company has dispatched hundreds of workers to help clean the spilled diesel now we'll have to see that when this spill will be majorly cleaned out Moving on to our country now, Vanishree will tell about Uttarakhand's hydro projects and the alternatives to it, which will cause less damage to our environment. So, before we talk about the present topic about if the hydro projects can be transferred to a non-eco fragile zone, we need to first look at the past projects that happened in the state of Uttarakhand, some delays and some consequences. So, after the unfortunate floods that devastated the hill state in June of 2013. The Supreme Court on 14th August 2013 ordered fresh environment impact assessment for around 24 under construction hydroelectric projects. These projects involved the investment of 20000 crore. These projects were to be taken place in the two rivers of Bhagirathi and Alaknanda. The fresh environment impact assessment was ordered to examine if these projects were the contributors for the tragedy. All of these projects have been stalled since then and many committees have come forward to examine the issue. The Supreme Court had also asked the Environment Ministry and the state government to not grant any environment or forest clearances for any project till further orders. But still they cleared the construction of Srinagar hydroelectric power project in Uttarakhand. Now moving on to the present that is 28th February 2020. The Supreme Court suggested exploration and feasibility study of shifting hydroelectric power projects to other non-eco fragile zones to resume the projects that have been stalled for the past 7 years. Now such kind of consideration should not only be done in the state of Uttarakhand but also around the country. Development should not be taken forward by the sole consideration of commercial benefit. Now that does not imply that we are against the need of power. but protecting environment and lives of people should be given a larger consideration as this project can be shifted to other non-eco fragile zones but not the populations such projects should be relocated to ensure the protection of the local people along with commercial profits now the entire state of uttarakhand is a part of the large ganga basin the ganga river is a trans boundary river shared between the countries of india and bangladesh The river is 2525 kilometers long and rises in the western Himalayas in the state of Uttarakhand. And it goes down southeast through the Gangetic plain of North India into Bangladesh. From there it empties itself in the Bay of Bengal. Uttarakhand has a total of 86 existing hydropower projects with the capacity of 3600 megawatts. 
of which 11 projects are in the private sector and the additional 1800 megawatts is in the central sector which means that majority of the power generated in the state is not owned by the state itself and there is no guarantee of how much of that power would be available for the state already 25 projects with 2376 megawatt capacity are under construction in uttarakhand six of which large hydro projects are with the private and central sectors of which three belong to the private sector and the other three belong to the central sector none of them are owned by the state sector the largest number of such projects are to be carried out in the alaknanda basin and the project with the largest capacity is proposed to be in the sharda basin with about 12450 megawatts now that we have spoken about the immense number of hydropower projects that are planned to be conducted in the state of uttarakhand of which most would not be helpful in developing the local populations let's talk about the kind of disasters and damage that these hydroelectric power projects cause in the area almost all hydropower projects of uttarakhand would lead to deforestation now we all know that ill effects of deforestation are huge they include erosion landslide flood loss of biodiversity etc moreover the compensatory afforestation done by the government usually involves plants of commercial importance like varieties of pine and teak but at the cost of naturally present broad leaf trees like oaks is not considerable it is also reported that the most amount of deforestation in the state of uttarakhand has happened mainly because of hydroelectric power plants now talking about one of the largest problems is building of dams diversion structures canals etc all of these components increase the disaster potential of the area in one way or another massive proportion of blasting and tunneling has been involved in the construction of all of these components which adds to the landslide risk and also weakens the young and fragile himalayan mountains now the construction of these hydropower projects form immense amount of muck due to tunneling and blasting which would typically be around millions of cubic meters of muck alone now the large projects are supposed to have a proper muck disposal plan which includes transportation of the muck to the designated area creation of safety walls and stabilization which all cause capital investment so the project developers and contractors are okay with dumping the muck straight into the nearby rivers as a result of which during frequent floods the illegally dumped muck creates massive disaster in downstream areas a similar case was seen in shrinagar hydroelectric power plant singoli batwari hydroelectric power plant etc this results in huge damage to the dams and the already constructed dams as a result of poor maintenance are no longer functional Furthermore the EIA guidelines are not followed for proper and honest assessment this was accepted on record by former environment minister Jairam Ramesh who mentioned that most of them are dishonest cut and paste jobs for disaster prone vulnerable states like Uttarakhand impact of disaster potential of the area should also be assessed but none of the assessment reports look into that matter our environment compliance system is non existent and there is no official body to ensure that the environmental norms are followed unless we address all of these issues mentioned above there is little wisdom in going ahead with more hydroelectric power plants in the state which not only invite greater disasters but also cause huge disasters for the local population now there is always a counter argument by the people on this matter giving statements like what about the development and we need energy and electricity for our day to day activities so keeping that in mind let's talk about some alternatives states like uttarakhand that are at high risk regions for disasters can opt for other power generation methods such as solar energy biomass based power hydrokinetic energy and micro hydro forms of electricity generation In addition better utilization of the existing infrastructure can cause a huge difference 
Alternatives to the hydropower dams do exist. These alternatives not only provide energy services but also water. While allowing the rivers to flow freely and preserving the environment for future generations, a diverse mix of energy sources is fundamental to any region's development. Technologies that provide almost similar amount of electricity to households and cost much less than hydropower do exist. For example, biomass gasifiers, which burn the waste of agricultural waste production to produce electricity. Small-scale micro and pico hydroelectric methods, which produce energy for personal households, are required, and these are done with the help of no dam construction and other available options. So we may wonder what is the key message here? It is simply that alternative technologies do exist in every region of India. It's just that we need to focus more on planned development and less on infrastructure. Then what about providing energy to the cities, the large-scale industries which need huge amount of energy? Of course, the city power requirements must be met, and this is where the demand-side management and energy efficiency come into play. We need to understand that there is less need of new large-scale power sources and more for participatory planning and proper assessment of environmental norms. If small-scale energy resources could be used for energy and power of residential and small energy requirements, then the already existing power plants could be sufficiently used for heavy industries. If these are done well, sustainable development can be the outcome. But then, projects like mainstream dams are looked at as options to be constructed in eco-fragile zones. Serious question marks should be raised. About social, environmental, and economic sustainability, would the results still be that positive? One such result of unassessed environmental clearance has been showing its result in India in the form of massive gas and oil leaks. Ritwik will be talking about certain gas leaks that took place in the country in the month of May due to improper environmental assessment. Without history, there is no memory, and without memory, there is no future. And yet, after the Bhopal gas tragedy, dubbed as one of the worst industrial accidents in the world caused by Union Carbide, India still sees a lot of industrial accidents due to sheer negligence and incompliance with the law. On 7th May, while we started our day with a cup of tea, a few residents of Vishakhapatnam woke up to chaos and confusion. Within hours, 12 people had died, and over 580 were hospitalized. The reason: a gas leak, a gas named styrene. Styrene monomer is a colorless and inflammable gas. If inhaled for a short period, leads to irritation in the eyes, nausea, respiratory problem, unsteady gait, loss of consciousness, and gastronomical effects. LG Chems, a South Korean-based company, purchased the plant responsible for the leak in 1997. It dismantled the old styrene plant and began storing imported styrene in a few tanks, of which one malfunctioned. It has been seen in the past that the plant didn't function responsibly as it operated without an EC. That's an environmental clearance from 1997 to 2019. A police control room located 10 to 12 kilometers from the plant received a distress call around 3:25 a.m. It immediately alerted the nearest station under whose jurisdiction the locality fell, which happened to be the Gopalapatnam police station. The station dispatched eight officers as immediate help. The officers reached R R Venkatapuram in 15 minutes. During the rescue operation, the officers saw people lying unconscious. As the roads were narrow, they couldn't take their vehicles all the way in and had to carry the unconscious and needy manually. The gas affected the rescue officers too, as they were seen vomiting, and the only protection they had was a wet cloth around their face. Most of them were later admitted and recovered, while some were still recovering. The ambulances arrived only after 6 a.m. and the NDRF 10th Battalion arrived at 7. wearing gas masks and carrying oxygen cylinders on their back to rescue the ones unconscious in their houses the national green tribunal was informed and they formed a group of five experts a high court judge a principal of a college a professor in chemical engineering and two scientists their report suggests that the storage units were outdated and neglected styrene monomer has to be under constant circulation to maintain an overall temperature however as a plant was shut down for 45 days it was left stagnant TBC tetrabutyl cathecol which is an inhibitor was not available in the required quantities which would suggest that the styrene monomer reacted inside the tank 
all this led to the styrene monomer to heat up and boil emitting the toxic fumes the founder of the sambhavana trust satinath sarangi critically viewed the report and came to the conclusion that the national green tribunal didn't mention styrene oxide which is an extremely toxic gas nor did it mention the effects of the fetus or genetic formation the emitted gas has proved to be a carcinogen when exposed to rats however the long term effects on humans have not been observed we can argue that the urban planning of the port is also to be held responsible normally in most of the cases industries are on one side and cities expand toward the others but in case of visakhapatnam the explosive expansion resulted in settlements around the chemical plants as of now around 40000 people live within 3 kilometers of the plant apart from lg polymers hpcl coromandel fertilizers are also located on the outskirts of the city for now a fine of 50 crores is levied on lg polymers according to national green tribunal officials lg polymer india has absolute liability which according to the law means that no excuses or reasoning can be done to avoid this ruling the firm asked for a review on the fine which was denied on the same day there was another gas leak in raigarh chatisgarh the seven workers of a paper mill factory were affected three of whom are critical and others recovering before anyone could get over these industrial accidents on 19th may villages near malkipuram of east godavari district experienced ammonia leakage which was leaked from an ice factory the gas was leaked from three tanks out of 10 residents within 200 meters were evacuated and nearby residents were alerted of the leak On 1st June, Kakinad locals alerted the police about a possible gas leak in the auto hangar, but the police couldn't find the exact factory, and an investigation was launched regarding the leak. After all these mishaps and industrial accidents, we see that proper laws and guidelines have to be issued to keep industries and companies in check. The EIA is one of the ways used by the government to ensure that these companies are working in accordance with the laws protecting the environment. However, the recent EIA 2020 notification shows the underlying capitalism in a democratic country where the motto changed from polluters pay to pollute and pay though we are at a juncture where economic growth has become a top priority and easing the laws will help the companies expand and produce more we should also see to it that in this process the environment is not ignored as ritwik said that how a company's negligence and outdated equipments caused a severe incident causing harm to the environment and humans on a large scale now let's see how another project that doesn't follow environmental guidelines could affect the environment to a great extent that is the road widening project in the western ghats western ghats is a 1600 km mountain range that stretches from gujarat in western india to tamil nadu in the south the range is a global biodiversity hotspot and a unesco world heritage site This hotspot covers less than 6% of India's land area but hosts nearly one third of the country's plants and animals including 325 endangered species. The Western Ghats is home to nearly 30% of the world's Asian elephant and 17% of the planet's tiger populations. The mountains are also the origin points for multiple rivers including the Godavari, Kaveri and Krishna. This road widening project is along the national highway NH4A that runs from Belgaum in Karnataka to Goa. This highway is usually a traffic free four lane highway. When we travel across it about an hour later, the road begins to narrow down and the surroundings change. The canopy grows so thick that the harsh daylight turns gentle by the time it reaches the road. The NH4A is now a two lane stretch for which the word highway doesn't quite seem right this is because before entering goa the road passes through this western ghats the protected area also known as pa through which nh4a passes in karnataka itself has been in a flux since 2015 the initial 2012 forest clearance granted for widening nh4a states that the highway passes through the dandeli wildlife sanctuary This sanctuary was merged with Anshi National Park in 2015 to form the present Kali Tiger Reserve. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change that is the MOEFCC recommends an eco-sensitive zone that is ESZ 
of up to 10 km around PAs in order to restrict human activity around it. The purpose of declaring a eco-sensitive zone is to secure areas around the national parks and sanctuaries. The Western Ghats is an ecologically fragile region. India's Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change (MOEFCC) has granted environment clearances that is EC to 76 projects in the Western Ghats. These grants are from July 2014 to March 2020. Of the 76 approved projects, one is within a protected area that is Karnala Sanctuary in Panvel, Maharashtra, and 18 are within 10 km of a PA. Linear intrusions that pass through PAs and NH4A qualifies as one in both Karnataka, where it goes through Kali Tiger Reserve, and Goa, where it penetrates the Bhagwan Mahavir Sanctuary and Mollam National Park. This not only leads to forest fragmentation but also endanger the wildlife over there. The 153 km NH4A also known as NH748 connects the industrial town of Belgaum to Goa a state with ports. For the NH4A widening the administration in both the states that is Karnataka and Goa did not seek the required environment and other approval. as per official documents that india spent has done large scale economic projects such as linear infrastructure mines and hydropower projects in natural habitats can disrupt ecosystems causing conditions that can promote the emergence of zoonotic disease the national highways authority of india that is nhai in an affidavit to the court said that 22000 trees were felled for the road widening and that there will be no more felling this was said by a bengaluru based environment lawyer on average there are around 1000 trees in a kilometer long stretch in between belgaum and goa karnataka border area this was said by the joint secretary of a belgaum based ngo paryavarni He also said that if trees have been cut on both sides of an 82 km long road how can the number of trees that the NHAI estimates it has cut to be just 22000 We have a lot of endemic species across all groups that are not found elsewhere particularly the amphibians and plant species that is the reason enough to conserve it Animals such as the Nilgiri tahar and the lion tail macaque and plants such as several climbers medicinal and aromatic plants are native to this particular region due to the construction of road there creates many problem to smaller animal populations and there's a chance of them going extinct purely due to inbreeding apart from creating physical disturbance road construction in mountains for instance also creates a lot of debris that is often dumped into nearby streams and rivers This can destroy riverine habitat and pollute the water upon which birds and other animals are dependent. The rules and clearances needed for project approvals differ depending on whether a project falls within a PA, within an ESZ or outside it. This is purely a bad news but ending on a positive note we can concentrate on the amount of habitat which is left untouched. and will continue to remain a safe place for the animals and plants to reside and grow talking about another positive approach vanishree will now talk about how some farmers and even the government turned an otherwise invasive plant called the water hyacinth into a boon in disguise yes i completely agree srishti we need to have a positive perspective when it comes to everything and that's exactly what these farmers fishermen and small industrialists are doing when it comes to facing the water hyacinth issue now let's talk about what these water hyacinth actually are these are small fibrous plants which are invasive in many parts of the world and grow on the water surfaces of fresh water bodies like rivers lakes ponds etc now these are made up of a fleshy leaf a semi succulent stem and brown fibrous roots and these are like the three main components of the plant so now that we've spoken about what a water hyacinth is let's talk about the kind of issues it causes for these people and the local communities living around the areas that are affected by the water hyacinth invasion 
So firstly, it causes hinderation in water transportation. That is, it clogs water pipelines and also a lot of canals and irrigation systems which leads to a decreased quantity and quality of water being supplied to the people that live around these areas. Also, there's an increase in evapotranspiration. Now, evapotranspiration seems like a big word, but it has a very simple concept. It is the increase in loss of water from a water body because of the high presence of weeds and plants in it. So as we all know, water, water plants take up a lot of water and a lot of it is lost in the form of transpiration. So evapotranspiration is a mixture of the outcome of evaporation and transpiration by these plants, leading to around two times more loss of water than normal evaporation in ponds and lakes that do not have many plants. Now, it also causes microhabitats for disease vectors. Like mosquitoes, it is an amazing breeding ground for these mosquitoes and also a lot of pathogens causing filiaresis, etc. So, let's also talk about the problems that it causes for the local fishermen. Now, the nets, hooks and other equipments used for fishing get stuck in these weeds and uh, it also causes a lot of problems with the maintenance of their equipments. Uh, also, the diversity of fishes in the pond decreases because of the plant which is present in such high quantities. Now, a lot of fishes and organisms that depend on water hyacinth or other similar weeds would survive in such waters. But the kind of fishes that do not survive on these and depend on other kind of organisms or plants for their survival would dwindle because of the fact that these invasive species hinder the growth of other local species and also other kind of plants or animals or organisms in the waters. So now that we've spoken about the kind of immense issues that these water hyacinth invasions cause for the local population and indirectly to the people that do not directly depend on them, we need to talk about the kind of methods that are usually used to reduce the invasion of this plant. So there are three basic methods where the first one is chemical, then we have physical methods and biological methods. So starting with chemical methods, it is not much used in the surrounding areas because it has a lot of issues when it comes to environmental pollutants and uh, using chemical barriers for reducing invasion of plants does need environmental clearance or a, a no objection certificate and a lot of clearances need to be done to obtain permissions to use chemicals to reduce the invasion of these plants. So not many farmers and local fishermen use these to get rid of the plants. Now these chemical barriers can affect the other kind of local plants and even the fishes that are present in the water body. So it's not very frequently used in different parts of the world. Now talking about physical barriers. Physical barriers to stop the invasion of this plant is obviously chopping off the plant and removing it out of the water with the help of cranes and other physical methods. But of course this has its own drawbacks because uh, the invasion is not in small quantities, it is huge. There are tons and tons of these plant vegetations caused in the water and removing all of it at once is not an easy task. Also, the uh, disposal of these waste materials is also difficult. Now, talking about physical uh, methods to reduce invasion, it does reduce invasion for a temporary period. But uh, of course, the seeds and the other kind of small stems and plants that remain in the water again lead to invasion. Then talking about biological methods. Now biological methods are seen to help to a somewhat good extent and uh, for reduction of these invasive plants this insect called a weevil is used. 
Now these weevils not only feed on these invasive plants but also cause a lot of pathogenic activities that results in negative causes for the plant itself. So uh, there have been results where around a 30% drop of vegetation of this invasive plant is seen in many areas after putting weevils in the water. Now also there are these kind of semi-equative grasshoppers that are also used for reduction of the population of these uh, invasive plants and uh, it does the same process of feeding on the um, plant and also causing some kind of pathogenic activity for the reduction of the uh, population of the plant. Also, there's this fish called the Chinese grass carp that can be used for a biological bar barrier as well. So, now that we've spoken about the barriers that are usually used, we need to also see the fact that these are expensive and uh, are not always available as an option for the local populations. Uh, so, there are other methods, alternative methods that can be used by these people to make a positive use of these invasive species and earn a little bit of income out of it. So, what are these methods? Firstly, as we know that the plant is fibrous, so a lot of things like paper, basket, yarn and rope can be made using the plant itself. Now, paper as we all know, can be made by the fibrous contents in the uh, plant but the quality of the paper is not as good as the ones that we get in the shop. Now these papers can be used for packaging material or things like that and have been proven to be a good source of income for the local population as well. Now baskets are made with the use of uh, rope and fiber material that is obtained from the plant itself and the local methods of weaving baskets and also other handicraft materials are used and it is a good source of income for the populations that survive on just fishing or farming of different materials and the things that are affected by these water hyacinths. Now there are these things called the charcoal briquettes. Now, what are charcoal briquettes actually? So, it is basically a compressed block of coal dust and it can be used for combustion of biomass material. Now, the water hyacinth can be pyrolyzed and formed into these charcoal briquettes and can be used by the local communities for generation of their energy. Now, talking about energy, Water hyacinth vegetation is really good source for bioenergy and biomass production. Also, the uh, water hyacinth when used and put into a good use for animal feed and fodder can also give great results. Also, as I said earlier that the Chinese grass carp depends on water hyacinth and different species of plants for its nutrition when aquaculturing these fishes the plant can be used in the form of fish feed after it's been dried and transformed into pellets. Now, these invasive plants are not all bad. They have a good amount of water purification qualities which can be used as a benefit for the people that live in these areas. Also, the water hyacinth can be used as an amazing fertilizer where it can be transformed into manure and used as great fertilizers for the plants in tropical areas. Now, talking about all these positives of the water hyacinth, we can truly believe that a lot of negatives that look negative in the first perspective can be used very positively otherwise. We cannot ignore the positives that are happening in the country when it comes to environmental protection out of all the bad and negatives that are currently being surfaced. So, uh, Ritwik will be telling you about the fact that the state has proposed a submerged plateau of Malwan as a protected area. Angria Banks, considered to be a submerged plateau, is located 105 kilometers of Malwan in Sindhudur district of Konkan region. But it was only recently that the Angria banks have been researched and explored by marine biologists to conduct a feasibility study as to make the area as a destination for marine tourism. 
India's Union Department of Science and Technology conducted a two-day exploratory study of the Angria Banks in 2010 with five scientists to document and survey the area which spread over 400 kilometers and only 20 meters below the sea surface. The area was found to be as big as the city of Mumbai and can be considered to be the largest discovery of coral reef in India. Now, what is the biodiversity recorded here? One can find 29 genera and 39 species of both hard and soft corals with the reef showing no evident signs of bleaching yet. That is turning white due to rising sea surface temperatures as an aftermath of climate change. This is based on an expedition carried out in collaboration with the Center for Marine Living Resources under the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Mangrove Foundation and Wildlife Conservation Society. The study found 123 species of fish, 43 species of invertebrates, numerous species of dolphins and whales, among other marine animals including the critically endangered sawfish, which is protected under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now, the great news about this place is that Maharashtra Forest Department has proposed to declare it as protected area. The proposal seeks to declare it as a designated area under Maritime Zones Act 1976. If approved by the central government, it will be the first maritime protected zone located in the exclusive economic zone. The proposed boundary for protection is approximately 61 km long and 50 km wide. Angria Bank was identified as one of India's 106 important coastal and marine biodiversity areas by the Wildlife Institute of India. Another interesting thing is protecting this area will help the country to contribute to its Aichi Biodiversity Target. Aichi Biodiversity Targets are an international framework of identifying wildlife and marine protected areas by 2020 developed by the International Convention of Biological Diversity. Marine biologist Sarang Kulkarni, who carried out the first documentation of the marine biodiversity of Angria in 2010, said, This is a welcome decision as this area is India's Great Barrier Reef. While there are reports of coral bleaching across the world, this is the one site along the Indian coastline where corals remain untouched despite the rising sea surface temperature. Enhanced conservation efforts are needed to ensure the biodiversity remains protected. Once this area is protected, it can be made available for marine ecotourism which helps to spread awareness about it as well as generate revenue for conserving it. I hope we can consider this to be a step in the right direction by conserving the environment instead of destroying it. So, we end today's episode here and we hope you enjoyed listening to us. If you really like this episode, please hit that like button and make sure to subscribe to stay updated. And don't forget to share this video. We'd really appreciate your humble support on Patreon. The link is down in the description box. So stay tuned, we'll be back soon with new topics. Thank you.